So thank you very much for being here. My name is Kendra Mohn, and I'm a PhD candidate at, at Bright Divinity School in New Testament, working on a dissertation. Not today, right? <laughs> but technically, working on a dissertation. Um, I, I also serve as teaching pastor at, at Trinity Lutheran in Fort Worth. So if you've ever been in Fort Worth and you've been to the stock show or the rodeo, we are across the street from the stock show and rodeo. Also nearby is the Cowgirl Hall of Fame and the Modern Art Museum. So we have a very interesting context um, in Fort Worth there in the cultural district. I serve there with my husband, so I'm part of a clergy couple. And then we have two children. And ordinarily I would be preaching during Advent, except this Advent I hopefully will be on maternity leave. Um, babies coming just before Thanksgiving. So uh, it's a busy time of the year for everybody, and I, I hope what, what this provides you is a day to think, set aside some time, reflect on how you might approach these texts. So when all of a sudden you wake up and you see the Facebook announcement that I had my baby, that's not the first time that you have thought about preaching, right? <laughs> which, can, which can certainly happen. So our, uh, part of our goal today is to be with each other and to be in the presence of these, these texts and possible directions to go. I find that sometimes when I, when I go to these, it is a little overwhelming because there are so many different directions. And so, yes, I'm going to present a number of possibilities um, for you, and some of them you're going to think, oh no, absolutely not, and some you think, well, maybe. So that's the, that's the goal, is to start that thinking process. So as you move forward into your sermon writing and your discernment with worship planning, that you have a little bit of an idea of where to go. As we begin this morning, um, I'd like to take some time for those who are perhaps introverts in the room, <laughs> and maybe even for the extroverts. I'd like to take a little time and think about your context, think about your preaching context. So that's where we're going to start. If you are a, if you are a person who um, processes by writing, feel free to do that. If you're more of just a reflector or thinker, that's fine. Um, I'd like for you to take some time and think about these questions. We'll spend about 10 minutes and, um, f and work your way through these. If there's one that appeals to you more than the other, that's fine. Uh, in my tradition, in the Lutheran tradition, we talk about law and gospel. Different traditions have lots of ways of talking about the very same concept. So one of the first questions I'd like you to consider is, what is the law for your people right now? And that we, by that we mean, where do they encounter where they fall short in the expectations of them as Christian community? If we put an issue in front of them, a question, a text, where are they going to see themselves and feel uncomfortable? So I'd like you to think about that. And then, of course, we, uh, we never stay at the law. We move to the good news, to the gospel. So what, then, is the gospel or good news for your people during this time in their life together? Third question would be, for what are your people preparing? Um, sometimes, as preachers, I feel like we are always preparing to prepare because we're only preparing to get ready for getting ready right, <laughs> during Advent. But what are your people preparing for in, in their context? And then the last question, what is the witness of your people in the world? If my husband were here, I would say, Pastor Gronberg, this is not a justification for your congregation's existence. <laughs> That's not what the question is. It is really more of an affirmation. Where is your congregation being a witness in the world at this point in its life together? Now, some of you may not be in a parish, and so that's why I um, kept the your people thing pretty general. Define that however you would like. Um, who, are the, who are the people that you need to be preaching to at this stage? So if that's if four are overwhelming, pick and choose. Um, work your way through them. We'll take about 10 minutes, and like I said, write or think. You will not be expect, expected to stand up and, and deliver this. This is for your own frame setting, for your mind, mind frame setting. Thank you. All right, thank you for participating in that exercise. You know your people very, very well, but sometimes it's good to think about them in a, in a focused way that will then provide context for what comes afterwards. So thank you for this. We'll return to these questions as we, as we move this morning um, throughout the text and also this afternoon. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to them. I'm, I'm going to be talking this morning about these texts. If you looked at them, you may have noticed some references to names that perhaps some readers who stand up in front of church have difficulty pronouncing. So we have a historical context that's going on. And because of that, I decided to um, go with my wheelhouse, which is my training at Bright in Empire. I study with Dr. Warren Carter, 
who is, as one of my other professors says, empire guy. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what he does. He talks about how the Roman Empire is context for the New Testament. So we're going to be um, filtering these texts through the questions of, of empire this morning. So um, I'm going to talk just briefly about what that means. What do we mean when we talk about empire? And then we'll move into, then we'll move into the text. Before I do that, does everyone have a handout that when you walked in you received? That's got your text in front of you? Okay. Empire critical studies is actually a, a, a specific kind of biblical criticism that people are doing now. They um, essentially have to go get a minor or a major in classical studies and learn all about the Roman Empire and then start to look at the texts with that as the background. This is um, still relatively new, but it's really gaining traction, partially because it's a brand, in a sense, it's a new way for people to be thinking about the texts, but also because it just provides um, alternate language and ways of thinking about parts of the text that we've skipped before because we've been focused on some other things. So why empire studies? One is that it was the dominant cultural power in the first century. It is, um, it, it is as if you were going to talk about Christianity in the 21st century now and not mention the US. No, why would you do that? <laughs> so one of the things we're going to try to do in this was in, in Paris studies is to talk about actually what was the dominant narrative that's going around and then contextualize the early Christian movement and the, the, the Jesus people within the context of that, of that dominant power. The second reason is because it doesn't take that long and Christianity actually becomes the religion of the empire, only a couple of short centuries. And they go from being this subsect of Jews, which were not terribly well understood, to being the, the rule, the law, the, the religion of everybody. So how does that, how does that happen? What is that about? So they, they, because that takes place, I think it's important for us to consider what context Christianity is born into. Third is that I think it speaks to our current context quite well. This depends, of course, on your perception, but there have been many people who have compared and talked about um, current economic powers in the world as empire, a different kind, perhaps, than Rome or Great Britain, but um, imperial nonetheless in the way that they have operated and maybe used their economic power. So there are lots of interesting connections and threads that you can find. Um, so I think it's a helpful context that way. Fourth, Star Wars. If you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know, um, we have a pastor here this morning who's actually wearing Star Wars shoes, so he's like advertising this, <laughs> that the, the movie is coming out, and I've had a number of people in my parish say, can I like serve communion at the early service <laughs> so I can get in line to go to the movie? There are so many great parallels and so many wonderful ways to illustrate these stories. So I think it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's just one of those nice accidents, happy accidents of history that we're going to have that um, come alongside. Uh, n the next one is, frankly, it's in the text. And oftentimes when people first hear about empire the first time, they think, why in the world would we talk about the Roman Empire from these people who live so far away and don't speak the language, and um, how would, what could they possibly know about Rome? And yet, it's all over in the text. So we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, we're going to make some connections about what, where maybe we've missed it before, and um, maybe retrain our eyes to see the text and see empire in a different way. And the last one is, frankly, why not? If you have been preaching for longer than three years, you've done this before. <laughs> Maybe you've done this before, like, I don't know, eight or nine times. <laughs> and so the, as we circle around every year, we, we find ourselves facing the same texts with different people, right? Different life circumstances, different global events, and yet we feel like sometimes we draw from the same wells to find something new to say. So, you know, why not? So even if you're a little skeptical, um, I invite you to jump on why not for the day and see what you think about this way of approaching, this way of approaching the texts. All right. So if we're going to talk about empire, some important things to consider that are, in fact, unique or distinct from our own cultural context that we would want to make sure we, we do before we dive into the text. The first is that when you talk about the Roman Empire and its power and its cultural influence and its religion, there is no distinction between religious and political. There's not even the pretense of it. We live in a, in a cultural context that's quite different, a political context where at least the 
attempt is made to separate church and state, if not religion and politics, and that people have different views about how that should happen. That was not even a conversation in the first century. So those who are in power, gain power, and hold power partially by the way they express religion. And then that, that, that feeds each other back and forth. So that's important. Sometimes we can, we can read the first century texts and try to overly spiritualize them in a way that isn't necessarily true to the context, the way that it would have been. Sometimes it's more comfortable for us in the 21st century to do so because we like to keep things separate. But if we're going to actually live in the world of the text for a while, they didn't do that. It wasn't, it wasn't important for them. Uh, it wasn't even really a question that they were having. Second, when you talk about the Roman Empire, there's two distinct ways to think about how it exerts its power. One, when we talk about Roman Empire, is in fact the concept of right to rule. The very force of power that comes from the emperor, is, that is the Roman Empire, and that is divinely sanctioned. They go to great lengths to explain why it is that they are divinely sanctioned the right to rule in the world. So sometimes when we talk about the Roman Empire, we're talking about that force of power. And I go like this on purpose. We are going from the top down. And we are going from one man, always a man, out. And out and down. And as you go down, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The largest classes are at the bottom. So this is a very specific kind of right to rule that is assumed. Secondly, then we also have, um, in addition to the right to rule concept, we have the actual land, the area. So the reach of the Roman Empire, how far it extends, I'll show you a map in a few minutes if you don't have one memorized, <laughs> will, will help us get that um, more firmly, I think, in our, in our heads. But when we talk about empire, we're talking about both this sort of force of rule and its extent, the breadth of its extent of, of control and power. That geographical reach was, um, it, it, it's maintained by an aristocratic focus on elites. It is actually re um, referred to, the metaphor that's used in some of the ancient literature is parasitic. At one point there's a conversation with a governor that it says, you know, if you bleed them to the point that they die, you won't get any more. <laughs> so they were oh, even aware of this, of this concept. The lower classes, the peasants, the, pe the ordinary people did not exist for any other reason than to uphold and prop up the empire itself. That was done um, in a variety of ways, but it's important to remember that, that that's, the, that's the image. That's what the, 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 the land that's taken over, that's what it's for, is to keep the empire itself going, to constantly fund the elite, to prop up the power of those in charge, and to keep that machine running, okay? And, of course, that's done uh, through a number of ways, but primarily through two. One is through military, and the other is through taxation, and they work together. Because you collect your taxes by the military, yes, and your taxes help pay for the military. So there is this, 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 little, this little symbiotic relationship. Um, so there's an omnipresent, I would say, omnipresent relationship for the people in the provinces of both soldiers and taxes. And there's all kinds of taxes. And they go to all kinds of places. So um, when, people are, it, when people talk about taxes in the New Testament, that's a lot, of what they're, it's a lot of what they're talking about, is this kind of parasitic relationship of propping up, propping up the empire. Questions at this point, so we've talked a little bit about justification for this sense of empire's context for the New Testament, and then also a few just points about empire itself. Yes. They work together. What do you mean by military and taxation work together? I don't know if I just didn't. Right. So um, it, Rome, the Roman Empire, in order to annex its, its territories, used first the military and showed up with the military and defeat, did whatever they had to do to defeat whoever was there. But then in order to maintain its power, then started to issue through the, through the governors and you know, through these people who would sort of rule from Rome, the, the tax structure. But for people who cannot pay their taxes, they have to have a really good reason to pay their taxes. And that reason is the soldier standing down the street, right? 
and that soldier standing down the street, in addition to paying taxes, may actually say to you, um, you know, if you pay your taxes this way this time, then maybe next time I won't take your donkey, right? So there's an enforcement that takes place there um, that keeps that part going. So it's an expression of power. So they're, they, I mean, they're just, they're so intimately connected. And then, of course, the other way around, right? So the military depends on the benevolent gifts of the people who are in charge to pay them. So there has to be a steady stream back to Rome in order to keep funding everybody. So I think that's what I, does that make more sense about how they go about their back and forth? All right. We're asking if you have a question to use the microphone, not because we don't think you can carry the room, but because there are some people listening um, uh, from distance learning, and so that's easier for them to hear if you use the microphone. Other questions? My pedagogical training says wait. 45 seconds. <laughs> I don't know if I have a question, but I'm taken, just reminded at least, between the religious and the political mm -hmm. lack of distinction. And I think I, and if it's a confession, if we're confessing or a, a question in here somewhere, <laughs> that I think I've always looked at the Jewish uh, leaders in the synagogue, the temple rulers, etc., being separate from the mm -hmm. political uh, realm, and namely kind of around the crucifixion, when we say it's not ours, it's yours, and one right. washes the hand of the other and sends it over. So that's an interesting reminder. Absolutely. And we can uh, get a, a little bit more into that in a bit when John the Baptist addresses the leaders and the crowds, but I think that's a very important thing because, yes, the Jewish leaders in, in the Holy Land, in, in both Judea and Galilee, but specifically in Judea, you know, their job was up and down. Their job was down in a sense that they were responsible for these people. They were responsible for their well-being, for their spiritual lives, and their responsibility was up, and that they needed to make sure that their, the, the Romans didn't get mad about something. So they were very much in a middle position, very highly political jobs, that they were allowed to have those positions because they kept things quiet, right? They, they were allowed to serve in those positions. They could be very easily replaced by those who would be more sympathetic to the empire. So they were allowed to keep those positions because they were doing, um, they were doing what pleased Rome. And it's important to keep that in mind. So embodied in the Jewish leadership, you have this tension, the up and down tension, the above and below. Um, yeah, so sometimes we keep those more separate than, than they really would have been. So yeah, that's, a, that's definitely an important distinction to make. I, I'm not only waiting for December 18th eagerly, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> I also watch TV. Um, <laughs> The AD TV series has its weaknesses, but it really tries to deal exactly with that. I think it's a real way to, good way to popularize in people's views if they watch that TV series mm -hmm. to see how the chief priest is really dealing with the Romans as well as the people, and and you see that more clearly than perhaps we tell at Christmas with the pretty story. And all that. Right, right. I don't think our focus on on Judaism and its um, and its traditions and its presence in the Scripture has been misplaced at all. I think that is incredibly important. It's foundational. There's no way around it. But I, when as a kid, you know, I grew up and I read these texts and I heard preaching and then I saw movies and I was like, what's that soldier guy doing there? <laughs> like, I, this never made sense to me. You know, you would watch these watch these things, and there were all these there were these little moments that would jump out and I'd be like, who's that guy? Why don't we talk about that guy? So I think it's putting those pieces together as part of what this Empire Studies is trying to do, um, keeping those in, in conversation with each other. So look up the AD series, because it sounds like that's a, a good way to sort of visualize and get in your own head the way that these, the way that these fit. All right. <clears throat> Anything else? Yes. I just have one question. So when you talked about the people in the middle, trying to keep the higher and the lower both happy at the same time, so was quiet oh, pretty much always the goal? However yeah. However that happened? Yeah. We're going to go there. The Romans had a word for it. They called it peace. <laughs> right? The Pax Romana. 
And uh, I'm going to talk about that in the context of Christmas Eve. And that really was the priority. That was, I mean, you know, Augustus made him, his name for himself by saying, he, I brought peace. I did it by killing you, but I brought peace. <laughs> and so that is, no, that, that's very much because that's the reputation the empire wanted to have. See how peaceful things are now? Don't you like us? And that, so that quiet is really very important. Um, you know, obviously, if we were going to be, if this is a, a Lent and Easter preaching workshop, we would work a lot on that, right? Because that's part of the problem of all of the Jews being incited in Jerusalem right before all this takes place with Jesus, right? Quiet is not happening. And they were always worried when they were going to be festivals, people would be all together expressing um, their faith and maybe their angst. So that's, that's a problem. Yeah, so that equilibrium was really important for those who were in charge because they're really far away. So they count on the people who are on the ground not to let it get out of hand because, you know, we don't want to have to send the legions, but, you know, we will. Like, well, we'll take care of it if we need to. So. All right, see, it's a good thing I waited 90 seconds, right? Excellent questions. Thank you very much.